If you would, please take and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I find it interesting uh, how many times we are a weighing people. For example, uh, raise a hand. How many of us are waiting for Christmas Day to finally arrive? A few hands here, a few hands. I was really expecting my children to not be paying attention because they've been waiting for Christmas for a really long time. When is Christmas? It's only five days away. That was two months ago, right? <laughs> but we are so often awaiting people. For example, right, when we're at work, what are we waiting for? The end of the day. And then halfway through the week, what are we waiting for? The weekend, right? Uh, we have these monumental things that we wait for, right? Uh, for us who are, who are younger, right? We're waiting for that day of graduation when there's no more school. Uh, maybe some of us, there's that, that waiting to be married, right? Uh, maybe there's this waiting for a new job, the excitement. And after you've been in that job, you're waiting for retirement, right? Uh, we're constantly waiting because we believe that there are some things worth waiting for. We believe that there's some sort of fulfillment that will come in the end that makes us long for and wait for something. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at the two characters from Luke chapter 2, Simeon and Anna, two individuals who were waiting. So if you would, please stand with me in honor of reading God's word. We're going to read Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 38. This is God's word. Let us hear and obey with God's grace. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, Simeon, took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother, Joseph and Mary, marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer, at night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, we pray that as we come into contact with your text this morning, as we see and behold your holy word, God, that you would reveal to us the glories and the beauties of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us hearts like Simeon and Anna. May we long for it, desire nothing more than what you can provide. Give us grace this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. So we begin with an introduction here to, to Simeon and Hannah. These are, uh, by what appears to be, two old godly saints. Uh, they were saints in this Old Testament way, longing for the consolation and the redemption of Israel and Jerusalem. Now, the text tells us that Simeon was, was righteous. A righteous here has the idea that he was righteous according to the law. He was one who kept God's covenant. He was faithful to the commands of God, and he was devout. Uh, he was not one who simply carried on his religious activity 
uh, as, as, as many do, uh, just out of uh, appearance sake, but he was wholly devoted to God. And we see, shockingly, that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Uh, this was not something common in that day. It was not common for the people to have the Holy Spirit come upon them. That's more of a new covenant phenomenon. In the old covenant, the Holy Spirit only came upon particular people at particular times for specific uh, events, for specific activities. So we see that David has the Spirit rest upon him. The, 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 those who, who designed and worked on the temple had the Spirit come and rest upon them. Kings and prophets, these different individuals at times would be have the Spirit rest upon them. But here, here is one who is uh, has the Spirit of God upon him. There's something unique and special about what he will do. And we have assume that he's old because he says that after seeing Jesus, he can now depart. So the idea is now he's approached the age of death and he can go in peace. We're also introduced to Anna. She is a spirit-empowered prophetess, one who speaks the mysteries of God. Now we also know she's old, but we're actually not sure how old she is. And the ESV does some interpretive work. It says that she was a virgin up until the time of marriage, and that she was married for seven years and then became a widow. Uh, where the Greek's a little bit hard to figure out is it could be that she's 84 years, uh, 84 years old and she's been a widow for, for 50 years, 50 some years. And this is how long she's been committed to temple worship. Or it could mean that she was a virgin, married for seven years, and has been a widow for 84 years. And so she may even be over 100 years old. It's just difficult to know. But here she is, this old woman who is committed to temple worship. And this temple worship that she's committed to is fasting and prayer. Now, why is it that we fast? What is the, the purpose of fasting? We fast when there is something that we long for and desire that food cannot satisfy. And there are times in which we will bring our body into the same sort of feelings that our soul feels. And so if the soul is longing for something, desiring something, craving something, Sometimes we will restrain from food so that our bodies feel that same sort of hunger. So we bring our body and our soul into alignment as we crave for whatever it is that we are longing for. Now, Simeon was promised that he would see the Lord's Christ or the Messiah. And on this day, Jesus being brought to the temple, according to the Jewish religious customs, he was brought to the temple on this same day. It says that the Spirit of the Lord brought Simeon into the temple on that day as well. And what we see here is that this is a divinely planned, divinely orchestrated meeting between these two. And this was not mere coincidence. And Anna, too, is present here with them. Anna there probably because of her commitment to the temple worship. And so here we have these two old godly saints who have now come to receive the Messiah. Now, why is it that Anna and Simeon were chosen to, to recognize the Messiah? What, what made them worthy of this honor of recognizing Jesus? Uh, the easy answer might be, we could say, well, they were holy. Right? They were holy saints. They were godly. Simeon was a man who was religious and devout. Anna was committed to temple worship. But I think a better question might be is, why are they holy? Why are they godly? What is it about them that has driven them to this life where godliness and holiness and, and worship has become so central in their lives? And I think what we see here is what has driven them or made them this way is because they have a, a longing, a waiting, a craving for God. And here I think we see that God will oftentimes stir in the hearts of his people a, a waiting, a longing, a desire for something. Simeon was waiting on, was desiring, was longing for the consolation. Anna was waiting for longing for, desiring redemption. Now, Simeon and Anna's waitings here 
are, are found, the solution is found in this infant Jesus. So let's look back at the text, verse 29. These are Simeon's words. Simeon says this. He says, now, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So here, the Lord has promised to Simeon that he would not die until he had beheld the Messiah. And Simeon, being given grace by God through the Holy Spirit, is able to perceive that this infant being brought in for the normal practice, the normal custom that the Jews carried out, was the Messiah. And he says that Jesus is the salvation for all the peoples. Last week we looked at and it said that, that Jesus was the good news, the good tidings for the people, for Israel specifically. But here we see just a few verses later that Jesus is in fact the good news. He is the salvation for all peoples. And we see this is includes the Gentiles. And thus Jesus is fulfilling what Isaiah said about the servant in Isaiah 49. Isaiah says this about the servant of the Lord. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations and my salvation, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Uh, Jesus here is fulfilling that which the Lord predicted and prophesied in Isaiah. But we also see Anna's words. Anna says that, uh, or what she does here, it says, and coming at that very hour, the very hour, the very moment that Jesus came into the temple, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him, to speak of this child, to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Upon Jesus entering into the temple, she immediately turned to worship, praising God, thanking God for what he had done, and then she began to let others know that the long-awaited one, that the Messiah had arrived to those who also were waiting for the redemption of Israel. The reality here is that Simeon and Anna desired something, they craved for something that the world could not supply. The world could not provide. Only God in Christ could fulfill these things that Simeon and Anna longed for. So what is it that, that Simeon and Anna longed for? So we'll see here that, that Simeon longed for consolation, while Anna longed for redemption. What is consolation? Uh, we don't use that word very much, but consolation is the comfort or the, or the encouragement given in the midst of suffering. The reality is, is that Simeon, like us, lived in a world that was infested with sin-sick people. People who had turned away from their commitment to God to their own commitments and their own values. And so here, he is longing for comfort. Again, we see this in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. When Isaiah says this, he says, or when Isaiah writes this, he says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So here in, in Isaiah's immediate context, the, the message is, is that God was, was bringing about through his prediction the, the, the remedy of their exile that their wars that she had endured would be put away with, and that he was pardoning Israel's sin, that they would no longer remain in exile, but that they would be restored to their homes. But here again, we find that Israel is in need of this, this consolation. They are in need of this comfort because they are, they are under the bondage of Rome, but more than that, they are under the bondage of their own sin. And so here, consolation, that that Simeon longs for is the application of the tenderness of God, the gentleness, the compassion. It is the restoration of that which has been lost, and it is the pardoning 
of sin. Jesus is the tenderness of God to those who have suffered and to those who have been afflicted. This could be, he, he is the tenderness of God that comes to remedy sin, whether it's our own sin or if it's the actions of the sins of another. Now, the reality is, is that all of us need this consoling. We all need this comforting. We all need his gentle care. This morning, there might be those who, who are enduring, especially in this Christmas season, a, a, a sense of emptiness, a lack of value and purpose. Maybe there's fear or frustration. Maybe there's resentment against someone who has, who has harmed us. Maybe there's doubt of whether or not God can, can bring us through a specific situation that we're dealing with. Maybe we're dealing with anxiety or depression. Maybe there's lostness. Maybe there's loneliness. Maybe there's guilt. Maybe we feel that we're in a helpless situation. Or maybe that we feel that we've committed a failure that cannot be remedied. The reality is that, that Jesus comes as the consolation. He comes as the one who, by his own nature, and by his love, can console us. He can comfort us. And for us who are in Christ, we have likely experienced that. Those dark and those terrible moments, those moments of despair in which the peace of Christ and the love of Christ comes and rests in our hearts, and he consoles us. He shows us his love and his compassion to us. This is what Simeon longed for. And it's great joy that Jesus has come. Again, we see from Isaiah 49, now verse 13. He says, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will bring and will have compassion. On his afflicted. This is who Christ is. He comes to those who are his people who have suffered, who are afflicted, and he comforts them. He brings them with a healing that they need, a healing that the world says it can offer, but it never brings a remedy. Anna was waiting for redemption. Now, this word redemption is only used one other time in the Gospel of Luke. It's used just in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, here Zechariah is prophesying. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Here, this redemption is the act of saving that comes through a horn. Uh, the imagery of a horn is strength, it's might, it's power. And so here, in this infant Jesus, the power of God, the strength of God, the might of God is coming to bring salvation. And here, Jesus is coming to deliver us from our current dangers, from our current foes. Uh, this is why the people of Jesus' time were so confused. Because they thought their great foes resided in Rome. They thought their great foes were Herod and Pilate, those oppressors. But those were not the great foes that Jesus came to destroy. Jesus came to destroy our true great foes, which are Satan and sin. He came to deliver us, to free us from the bondage from the enslavement that they had over us. Jesus is our great deliverer. He doesn't deliver us from the tyranny of man, but from the tyranny of sin and Satan. And no matter what it is in your life that is controlling you, manipulating you, forcing you to do that which you do not want to do, Christ is sufficient to save you from it. And so maybe it's drugs and alcohol that are controlling and having dominion in your life. Maybe it's lust, pornography, adultery, or some other sort of sexual sin. Jesus has the power to save you from it. 
Maybe it's gambling, power, food, fame, or money. None of these things will ever be able to supply that which our heart most longs for. And Christ can redeem it from us. Maybe it's anger or jealousy. And these are the manipulative tools, the, the ways of sin and the devil to enslave us, to, to control us. And Jesus comes as the one who can deliver us from them all. Jesus is the sufficient one who can defeat every foe. We do not need to turn to the ways of the world. We turn to Christ because he is the redemption of Jerusalem. He has prevailed over them all. He has pardoned our sins and he has defeated the serpent. He has bound the serpent and he does not exercise authority over us any longer. But what we see here is this, there's this great longing, right? Simeon longing for the comfort, for the compassion of God. Anna longing for the victory of God. But the story really isn't about Simeon and Anna. It's about this child, this most unexpected event, a child appointed. We see that, that this child is the chosen servant. And that because of this child, many will fall and rise in Israel. Here, this, this harkens back to Psalm 118.22, that there was a stone rejected, but that this stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Many will, will rise because they put their faith and their hope in Christ, but he will also be the result of many destruction who reject him. But we also see that not only is he the chosen servant, not only is he the appointed child, but he is also the suffering servant. The suffering servant that we see so beautifully pictured, beautifully on this side of the cross, not necessarily beautiful, beautiful in, its own, in its own way, but from the end of Isaiah 52 and into Isaiah 53. Here, Simeon speaks to Mary, and he tells her that a sword will pierce through her own soul. Mary will live a life in which she sees her son rejected. She'll be the one who, who sees the way he is acting and being treated. And she will also be the one who stands at the foot of his cross and sees when her own soul is pierced as his hands and his feet are pierced as he is crucified. It is at the cross where Jesus earns for us and merits for us the salvation and the comfort we long for. And we see that he's appointed for revealing the hearts, the thoughts of the hearts. In this text, we have two protagonists, two, two good parts of our story, Simeon and Anna, waiting on God, longing for someone who could come to satisfy their heart's desires. The antagonist will be those who, who reject Jesus, who look upon Jesus and find no satisfaction in him, who look upon Jesus and can't find anything worthy of him. They are satisfied by the world. They are pleased by what the world offers, by the trinkets. So I think the application for us is, is where are we today? Are we waiting on the Lord, or is our longing for something else? In the cross of Christ, we see that he is the one who delivers us, who sets us free. It's in the cross of Christ that we see his great consoling. The Bible tells us that Jesus endured all temptation and yet without sin. He knows exactly what it is that we are dealing with now. And he alone is sufficient to console us, to care for us, to minister to us. But he is also, in the cross, we see his great victory. We can only imagine how Satan and the demons must have thought that they had finally gained the upper hand. The Son of God slain. The Son of the Most High defeated 
in this most epic fashion, nailed to a cross. But yet it is in that cross that Jesus accomplishes final redemption and salvation for his people. It is in the cross that he puts to open shame the evil forces of the world. He parades them as, as armless, as, as having no power before him. In the cross, Jesus does this. And so for the unbeliever who might be with us, do you care for Christ? Does Christ have any value to you? Do you long for the consoling and the redemption that only he can provide? Or are you pleased just to indulge yourself on what the world offers? Where are you this morning? But as a pastor of a, of a church, my primary concern is for, for those who are professing to believe. Where are you and is your longing and your waiting for Christ only? Do you long for his consoling and his redemption? Or are you too satisfying yourself with the things that the world can provide? We as a Christian people should be a people of longing and waiting and desiring. This is what the author of Hebrews says. In chapter 9, verse 28, it says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear sins for many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. There is a salvation coming. There is a, a redemption coming. There is a consoling coming. Coming. And the question is, is, are we longing for that? Or are we so satisfied by all of these things in the world that we ignore and don't even give much concern or care for the Lord's coming? Because he will come to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The negative is, is there. But those who are not awaiting him he will not come to save. Uh, do we long for his appearing and his salvation more than anything? Hear the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Are we so committed to Christ that all we want is that crown of righteousness? We want that day of his appearing when we will see him and behold him and we love it. Or are we saying, tarry Lord a little longer? I'm not quite done with all these indulging that I'm enjoying here. Now I think in many of us, there is a longing for the lost whom we love dearly. And we might be saying, Lord, save them before you come. Save them before you come. Please, oh God, save them before you come. And I think that's appropriate. But we cannot be those who are saying, Lord, just wait a little bit longer. I've got this advancement in my career. I've got this interest, this relationship I'm pursuing. I've got this happening and, and it's really good. God, just wait a little bit longer. We must be those who hunger and thirst for God, who long for God, who are crying out, Maranatha, our Lord, come, come, Lord Jesus, your kingdom, come. If that is not your heart this morning, be reconciled to God. If your heart doesn't long for Jesus more than anything that the world offers, be reconciled to God. God is sweeter. He is better than anything that the world can offer. Love God and find your consoling, your comfort. Find your salvation, your redemption, your victory in Christ. The world cannot provide it. It will, it will constantly flirt with you. It will constantly tell you that you can find these things in it. They will always let you down. Be reconciled to God. Christ alone 
is our comfort and our redemption. Lord Jesus, come. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness this morning. Oh, Father, give us hearts like Simeon and, and Anna. And Father, let us be devout. Let us be longing for the day that we will see your Christ. And give us hearts like Anna. May we be those who, who worship, who fast and pray for the coming of your kingdom. Your kingdom come, O oh Lord. Oh God, give us the grace to long for you, to long for your Christ. Lord, let Jesus come. Lord Jesus, come. Come and make your home among us again. Come and redeem us. Come and save us from this world. Father, we do pray for those we, we love, and even those we don't know. We pray for salvation to come. Lord, selfishly, yes. We pray especially for those who who are in our families, who are friends, who don't know you. God, we pray, we pray, save them before you come, Lord. Save them before you come, but do not delay your coming, Jesus. Lord, we pray you'd come and give us hearts that long for it, that love your appearing. Give us grace to this end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.